Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Varshini Prakash. I use she, her pronouns, and I am one of the co-founders of Sunrise and currently serving as the executive director. And I am also one of the co-editors of Winning the Green New Deal, Why We Must and How We Can, um, which we will be discussing here today with our brilliant guests. Um, so before we begin, I actually would like to pass the mic to my friend and comrade, um, Julian Brave Noisecat, who is a contributor to this book and who will be opening this evening's conversation uh, with a land acknowledgement. So to you, Julian. Uh, thank you so much, Varshini, and thank you so much for uh, letting me write a chapter of a book. And now you guys have to listen to me talk, too. I mean, it's crazy what they're letting me do out here. It's getting kind of out of control. Uh, but wait, quite uh, up. Julian Brave Noise Cat wins quest. When Kika had a quest for Alexander Roddy, F1 Kaka had a quest for Erachi Noise Cat. So, quite much in a statement can that's asking which deck went to Oakland, which deck went. Let one poopsman, Ne Elia Tech to me, where Piscataway Ulu, where Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Julian Brave Noise Cat. Um, I guess in sort of progressive circles, we do our pronouns. I use he, him pronouns. Um, among my people, we usually relate our uh, genealogy, our ancestry. Uh, so I introduced uh, not just my name, uh, but also who my, my parents are. Uh, you guys don't need to know them. I don't want you Googling them. So we'll just leave that between me and my ancestors. Uh, and I come from the, uh, the Sequetmoch uh, and Statlian nations in what is now uh, British Columbia, Canada, uh, but I grew up in, in Oakland, California. There's this thing called the Jay Treaty that you guys should all uh, read about. It allows First Nations people to live here in the United States. Um, I'm calling in today uh, uh, from Washington, D.C., which is the uh, traditional territory of uh, the Piscataway uh, people. Uh, it is, of course, a, a city that was uh, built uh, uh, with the uh, labor of uh, enslaved Black people, which I think is an essential other part of acknowledging the land uh, that we're on. I'll leave it at that. Uh, usually, uh, if you, this was like a, an Indian gathering, we'd be like saying a whole prayer. We'd have a whole spirit plate. I have my uh, shrimp fried rice as my spirit plate that I'm going to eat later. Um, and really excited for this conversation, really grateful for the opportunity to um, speak along so many wonderful panelists, uh, as I'm sure you guys will find out very soon, the folks who edited and, and wrote this book and who uh, are engaged in the movement that uh, led to its creation are, are incredible people. And um, I just feel very lucky to uh, call some of them friends and colleagues. Thank you, Julian, for that beautiful opening. Um, and I'm really proud to be here with you and with Guido, my awesome co-editor, and Ian, and Alex, and Rihanna, and the hundreds of you who will be watching online to talk about this moment, um, about the Green New Deal and the path forward. Um, I feel like I really need this conversation right now, and you all are my personal heroes. I'm thrilled to be having it with you. Um, so for all of those uh, for those of you watching right now, we are streaming live on YouTube. If you have any questions, please submit them through the YouTube live chat. We're going to be collecting those and we'll um, take some of them and, and pose them to our awesome guests. So as I mentioned, I mean, this conversation could not come at a more important time. Like right now, wildfires in California and Oregon and Washington are destroying communities. 20 times more land has burned in California this year so far than all of 2019 combined. And almost 200,000 acres burned just last night. Um, I visited the small town of, of Paradise, California last year, a town whose population had gone from 20,000 people to 1,500 after being hit in one of the worst fires to date in 2018. And right now, communities in, in Paradise and those all around the surrounding area are being told to evacuate again as the fires close in. Um, Michaela Butson is, is a brilliant leader from Paradise, and she actually contributed a story and a chapter to this book. Um, I'd like to read from it to open us up today. And her chapter is called Paradise, May It Be All Its Name Implies. In Paradise, California, there used to be a sign that read Paradise, May It Be All Its Name Implies. I grew up surrounded by trailer parks, decrepit mobile homes, and unkempt yards. 
While it was not always, in fact, a place that was all its name implied, paradise was still my town. Now people know it as the home of one of the deadliest and most destructive wildfires in history. On November 8th, 2018, my mother sent me photos of the fire. She had been working her early morning job when she spotted a strange looking sunrise peering out over the mountains in the direction of paradise. My brother was at home asleep. She raced back toward the fire to get him. And as she drove, flames traversed the mountainside and black smoke engulfed the trees. Um, I frantically searched every Facebook group I knew of looking for answers for where my family was when I lost contact with them. I saw videos of people driving through flames and burned bodies trapped in cars. I read stories about people stalled in parking lots and sheltering in pharmacies. I didn't know where my family was. All I knew was that they were driving through paradise where the fire was growing by a football field every second. Several hours later, my brother called. He and my mom had escaped. They said they would have gotten caught in the fire if it wasn't for a man frantically waving and screaming at them to turn around and drive the other way. Our home sustained extensive damage. The town I knew for nearly my entire life now consists of rubble, contaminated drinking water and dangerous debris. We fought for months with the insurance company, eventually selling our home as is and leaving nearly everything behind because we couldn't afford a moving truck. Every day, I think about those burned places, not just because they were places I enjoyed, but because they were owned by people, people whose whereabouts remain a mystery to me. I think about how my story can and will become the story of many others, of towns that will burn or drown or otherwise collapse under the impact of climate change. For them, I will fight until every town is guaranteed a just and sustainable future. So I'm really sitting with Michaela's story today and the thousands millions of stories that are getting created out of this moment. Um, and every moment that comes uh, from, you know, the storms that are ravaging the Gulf South, from the pollution that impacts communities in Detroit, from the climate gentrification that is happening in Miami. Um, I think the future that we fear is, is upon us. And, and I saw writer and activist Mary Heglar said on Twitter today, I don't need a time machine to see climate change. All I need is a window. And all the while, our country is still reeling from the shooting of Jacob Blake by cops in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and, and the murder of two protesters killed by a white supremacist. Tens of millions of people remain unemployed and a wave of evictions is taking place across the country. The pandemic, of course, continues to claim victims every day. And we watch our president lying, uh, lying about the truth, that, that he knew the truth about the coronavirus. And so I'm, I'm so grateful and humbled to be in this conversation because I believe in a world where our pain and our crisis is so interconnected, um, so must be our solutions and our liberation. And that is ultimately the vision of the Green New Deal and of a society and a government and a world that works for all people. So welcome, all of you. Thank you for being here. Um, the stakes of the moment could not be greater. And however you are arriving in whatever state, you are welcome here and we are glad to have you. Um, and I also wanna thank um, Haymarket Books and Porter Square Books for being our co-sponsors and our partners for this event. Um, and now I'd like to introduce my co-editor of Winning the Green New Deal, co-creator of Sunrise, um, who's a media director with Justice Democrats um, and a dear friend and moderator for this evening, Guido Gigenti, just say a couple of words before we open up the, the discussion and introduce our awesome panelists. Thanks so much, Varshini. Um, it's really surreal to have launched this book two weeks ago and we did an event as a hurricane was making landfall in the Gulf. And now at our second book event, uh, we're talking as unprecedented wildfires are raging in the West. And when we started editing this book over a year ago now, we felt, I remember our editor saying to us, you know, I really want to produce something that convinces people that the GND is just as big as it needs to be and just as, as ambitious as the crisis calls for. And uh, it tragically feels easier and easier to make that argument. And it feels like the book is just being launched into a world that is, is the, the beginning chapter of, of a future that we're trying to prevent. Um, 
it's our hope that this book is a compass for the fight over the next year. And I hope that folks joining us tonight use the book in that way and, and use it to go out there and organize bigger and bigger protests and bigger strikes next year. Um, and I also hope that it can be a guide to not just why the GND is so big, but why confronting racism and inequality are so central to actually winning, which is what we'll be talking about tonight with our great panelists, who I'll let Barshani introduce. Cool. Um, okay, so up first, we have Miss Alexandra Rojas, who is the Executive Director of Justice Democrats, um, which if you don't know them, you got to follow them, the progressive political organization that is um, most well known for recruiting Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to run for Congress and for helping launch the Green New Deal alongside Sunrise Movement. Um, and they're working to elect a whole new generation of Green New Deal champions in Congress like Jamal Bowman and Cori Bush and Marie Newman and so many more. Um, and uh, so welcome, Alex. I'm so thrilled to have you here. And um, next we have Julian who introduced himself in a better way than I can introduce you. Um, but Julian is the Vice President of Policy and Strategy for Data for Progress. Y'all gotta follow Data for Progress. I learn all the facts, all the figures, all the knowledge that I need from Data for Progress and they are brilliant on a number of issues including the Green New Deal. Um, and he's also the Narrative Change Director for the Natural History Museum. Um, and his work has appeared, he's a really fantastic writer and his work has appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, Rolling Stone and lots of other places. Um, Ian Haney Lopez is, the, uh, is a law professor at UC Berkeley who specializes in critical race theory. And in particular, his book, um, Dog Whistle Politics was actually um, one of the most um, uh, one of the books that informed Sunrise's strategy uh, in a huge way when we were actually building and creating the movement. Um, and it details essentially the 50 year history of, of coded racism in American politics. Um, and uh, he also um, has another book called Merge Left, um, in which came out in 2019, where Ian Kind of explains further about Trump's relationship with dog whistling and about the race class um, uh, narrative and response. And last but very much not least, we have Rihanna Gunn Wright, um, who has serves as served as the director of uh, serves sorry as director of climate policy at the Roosevelt Institute. Um, and before joining Roosevelt, Gunn Wright was the policy director for New Consensus, where she was charged with developing and promoting the Green New Deal amongst a lot of other projects. Um, and Rihanna was also the policy director for Abdul El Sayed's 2018 Michigan gubernatorial campaign, which was one of the first campaigns that Sunrise ever worked on back when nobody actually knew who we were, except Abdul. Um, cool. So that is our amazing, phenomenal set of panelists. I'm so excited that you all get to hear their wisdom tonight. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Guido to kick off the first round of questions and conversation. Thanks so much, Varshini. Uh, Ian, I want to start with you. Uh, as Varshini mentioned, your book, Dog Whistle Politics, was foundational for the thinking that went into uh, Sunrise before it was called Sunrise, when youth activists were thinking about what comes next after Trump got elected. Since the Green New Deal grabbed the spotlight in 2018, um, there's been this debate raging. How important is it for climate policy to address racial justice? And why are these young people sitting in in these offices so insistent that the Green New Deal weave racial justice throughout its policy proposals? Um, but this debate didn't begin in 2018 with the Green New Deal. Indigenous peoples and frontline communities have been making this argument for decades, if not centuries. And you also, Ian, I think were early to this story, even though Dog Whistle Politics uh, is not a book about climate change. I think when Varshini and I read that book in 2015, we realized that our movement had not grappled as deeply as we needed to with why and how specifically racism in the United States could lead us to lose the fight for a Green New Deal, even if we did everything else right and had brilliant organizing strategies. So Ian, I wanna hear 
why, in your words, con confronting racism is essential to winning a Green New Deal. And you wrote that book over five years ago now. I'm wondering if, if your analysis has changed in this past couple of years as you've seen the right wing and the Democratic Party respond to the Green New Deal. Yeah, <clears throat> great question. You know, let me let me start. Let me let me back up for a little bit and start first by saying thank you. Um, right now, you're seeing me. I'm coming to you from an Airbnb in Utah. Um, I left the smoke in the Bay Area. This this is you know, and and I have lots of resources. I'm well off. I'm I'm fine. But these harbingers of change are upon us. And if anything has changed over the over the last five years. My love for you is going on more intense. You guys are awesome. I fully support you. What else can I do, right? I mean, we have to do this now. I wanted to start by saying thank you. I also wanted to pick up on what, what Julian had said and the way he started with a land acknowledgement and who we are and where we are and how we're located. And partly it seems to me that's so important because it, it asks us to ground ourselves and to be thoughtful about how we got here. But partly I think there's, a, there's this other dynamic that I want to surface. When we ground ourselves in past social practices, we're acknowledging what humans have done. And that's important in terms of taking responsibility, but also in generating hope. Because what we've done, we can repair. Things that we've harmed, we can heal. And I, and I think that that's the sort of the spirit, the zeitgeist of the Sunrise Movement is to say, let's be serious about what we've done. Let's be hopeful about what we can achieve what we can do together. And that's the Green New Deal, right? This is, here's the route, here's the plan. Okay, so when do they get, here's the plan. Now, a lot of people say, great, you've got a plan for averting climate collapse. Why focus on racism? And I wanna distinguish three different ways we could answer that question. One way we could answer that question is by saying, well, we need to focus on racism because some of the communities that are harmed the most by environmental degradation, by climate collapse are communities of color. This is true domestically, this is true internationally. Um, if we care about racial justice, we should see that environmental justice has a disproportionate racially adverse effect. Completely agree with that, yes, not the argument I'm making. Here's another argument that says, the ethos of taking care of the planet is an ethos of interconnectedness. It's a rejection of separation. It's an acknowledgement of our connection to each other and to the planet. And that ethos requires us to fight racism as a moral matter. 100% love it, completely with it, not my argument. What I'm trying to advance, and this is, I, I see it not as a competitive argument, but as a, as a compliment. These all go together. But the critical point that I think we need to recognize can be summarized this way. The number one weapon of those people profiting from pollution is racism. The number one weapon of those people profiting from pollution is racism. And, and it's not just, it's not the polluters in particular, the Koch brothers, the, the Koch brothers, uh, owners of the largest privately held petrochemical conglomerate in the United States, they turned around and created a donor network of ultra-rich corporations, family dynasties, billionaires, and they used their power to fund racial division. They helped turn the, the Tea Party from a grassroots anxiety about the, you know, Barack Obama and, and cultural change and racial change into a massive political movement that helped elect a, a, a number of politicians who cared first and foremost about helping the Koch brothers and the billionaires. In other words, to put this point as, 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 as precisely as I can, the number one strategy of those people who wanna keep polluting because it's good for their bottom line is to fund racial division. And if we do not overcome racial division and create a multiracial movement to oppose them, we cannot save the planet. And this is, this is true in terms of fighting racism and its disproportionate harms against communities of color. It's true as a moral matter, the ethos of taking care of each other and taking care of the planet, but it is also true as a simple pragmatic reality. You cannot save the planet. You cannot avert climate collapse without defeating racial division as the number one weapon that is being used against us right now. Donald Trump, 2020, that's what's happening.
Thank you, Ian. And if there's anyone in the audience who feels like there's someone in your life who just doesn't get why race needs to be a part of this, give them Ian's chapter. Um, it's just such a, a, a pithy distillation of uh, for, the, for the people who want to be sober and reasonable and just get something done, why getting something done requires confronting racism. Um, but it's not just in the political strategy, it's also in the policy itself. We're trying to build a multiracial movement that can defeat the tactic of racial division. Um, we need a policy that can be championed by a multiracial movement. And Rihanna Gunwright has been one of the leading architects of, of building that Green New Deal. And Rihanna, I'm interested uh, in hearing as you have developed the Green New Deal, um, how specifically you feel that on a policy level, policymakers like yourself have moved the debate and been able to uh, integrate commitments to racial and economic justice. And perhaps it'd be helpful to take a step back and also just name what the Green New Deal is. Uh, is, is the Green New Deal a policy? And if it's not a single policy, how should we, how should we best understand what the Green New, New Deal is and how these commitments to racial and economic justice are being interwoven with the policy coming out of it? Um, thanks, Guido. Uh, uh, and thanks for uh, having me. It's an honor to be here. Apologies for looking like who did and what for. I also have a collared shirt somewhere, uh, but my dog shit in my car three times before 11 a.m. and it's my anniversary. So, uh, you know, we're doing this. Uh, so what's the Green New Deal? Is it a policy? Um, uh, no, uh, that's the quickest answer is no. Um, so the interesting thing uh, about policy and why I think it's important to actually back up and ask what is policy? Uh, because often when people sort of laugh off the Green New Deal, oh, it's not a policy. They don't actually tell you what policy is. Are you talking about? Because there's tons of different forms, right? Um, there's laws, there's regulations, um, there are incentives uh, built into the tax code. There's lots of ways uh, to actually shape uh, a policy. But the thing is that policy isn't like a fully baked thing that comes out. Solutions are based in a lot of things. They're based in principles, they're based in values, they're based in how we define problems. And if you don't have a good sense of that, it's very difficult to write coherent policy, particularly for something like the Green New Deal, which is so broad. Uh, and so what the Green New Deal is, is a, is a policy proposal and a framework. So the congressional resolution is a framework for essentially that lays out the principles of the Green New Deal, uh, hence that sort of like the ideological roots, the sort of theory and beliefs behind it, um, and defines the problems uh, that the Green New Deal, uh, once it is sort of official policy, uh, that it's going to be trying to solve. And that's really important because for the Green New Deal, so the, the policy proposal of a Green New Deal, sort of the framework, uh, is for a 10-year economic mobilization. That's what the Green New Deal is. It is a 10-year mobile economic mobilization uh, to do three things, reduce greenhouse gases, create millions of good paying jobs and redress social uh, and racial inequities. Um, and, um, and of course, economic inequality, but that's sort of covered in the jobs piece. Um, but the, and the reason that that framework was important was before the green, was because before the Green New Deal sort of popped on the scene, those three things were not, not fused in that way. And so you can't come out with a bunch of laws what are proposals for legislation if people don't know why you're defining the problem the way that you're defining it right because the green deal went from talking just about climate in a very technical bounded 
uh, sort of market interventions, carbon tax, carbon pricing, et cetera, carbon offsets, way until talking about the Green Deal as uh, climate change is like a holistic issue uh, that has to do with the way that our economic and social systems are created uh, uh, and designed. And that, and all of that wasn't new, it came from uh, a, a lot of thinkers, but that fusion was new and we put it out because um, if you're gonna build support for anything, including a policy, much less get people to take you seriously, you have to sort of take them in steps. If you are proposing solution to problems that people don't connect in their head, why would they listen to your solution? Why would they think that um, you're telling the truth? And so the Green New Deal, uh, as it was released and as it still stands, is both a framework for future policy action and sort of uh, a broad proposal for how we both define climate change as a problem and tackle it. Uh, and, and so that's, that's where it is now. Now, the work of turning the Green New Deal from a framework into a set of concrete policies, the work of getting from the vision to the how, to the outcome, right? Right now, we're trying to figure out the how uh, and get those things instituted. And so that work is ongoing. And so uh, and it's happening in a lot of places. And so you have folks like the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Public Policy putting out their version of a Green New Deal for a Gulf Coast. You have folks doing research on what kind of jobs will come out of a Green New Deal. So you have a lot of work, right? You have the Green New Deal for Public Housing, which is a concrete legislative proposal for the Green New Deal for Public Housing. So these things are moving and the work is just a lot of folks coming together to work through, uh, work through these ideas for the policies. Um, and so that's going on. And as far as how do you keep sort of racial and economic justice at the center, uh, design for it in every aspect. Equity doesn't happen on accident. And so when we're thinking about racial uh, and economic justice say in the Green New Deal policy work that I'm collaborating on, that's something that we're asking at every point, which is how does this affect the balance of power for marginalized folks? Does this give more power to people of color? How does it do that? And so that's, it sounds, simple, uh, but that's kind of because in a way that it is simple. We often treat racial and economic equity as like these things on the side, but the truth is to make it happen, you actually have to be thinking about the impact and what sort of um, relationship you want uh, those communities to have to, pow to power. How do you want to empower them? Be thinking about that as you're designing out everything from sort of top lines to implementation. Thanks, Rihanna. And thank you for enduring the triple shit in your car from your pet uh, and still making it to this book launch event. It's really, it's a hard, it's hard times out there. Um, but uh, it's such an important point that you make. And um, I think your, your chapter does an excellent job of this as well that in addition to the political strategy that Ian is talking about, uh, around, about divide and conquer racism, that when we define the problem of climate change, when we miss that part of the, the problem is that certain communities, communities of color, working class communities um, are consistently disempowered such that there can be refineries, fracking wells, put into their neighborhood, that is part of what allows the crisis to be driven forward. And if you don't empower those communities, you're, you're leaving this political status quo in place that just makes it easy for Governor Gavin Newsom to give out more than 50 fracking permits since April, despite the worst wildfire season in history. Um, Julian, this is a point that you've been making, not just in this book, but I think in journalism that you've done throughout this year about what it would mean for climate policymakers and Green New Dealers to learn from uh, indigenous peoples and indigenous communities. Um, you talk about uh, that those who know what it means to lose our world, speaking of indigenous communities, 
might have something to lend to humanity now that all of us are facing existential crises in the form of, of a pandemic and climate change. Um, and I, I, I feel like I've read a lot about um, indigenous practices of ecology and conservation that we can learn from, but you make this broader point about um, lessons about democracy and sovereignty and rights that are essential for Green New Dealers to learn to effectively design and implement the kind of policies that Rihanna is talking about. Can you tell us more about what you're, you're getting at there? Um, yeah, sure, happy to. I, we're gonna solve all the problems with this one answer to this question. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see. So firstly, I just want to say that I, I very much agree with uh, Professor Lopez's uh, point about racism being weaponized. And it's not just because he teaches at the university just up the street from where I went to high school, which is Berkeley High. Uh, and obviously, I, I agree a lot with what, what Rihanna said about we need to design uh, for equity. I guess my where, where my sort of comments um, tonight sort of add or relate to those two points, which I think are really essential to hold, um, is that, um, well, let's do this in the form of a story. So in early 2019, I uh, traveled to uh, the Yankton Reservation in uh, South Dakota, where in their, um, the bingo hall in their casino, uh, they were holding uh, a sort of gathering where we were uh, discussing uh, and also just sharing in food and meeting uh, sort of the resistance to the Keystone XL uh, pipeline. And I think here's where uh, sort of these fun deeper sort of fundamental questions about governance, democracy, sovereignty, all that sort of stuff come in. Um, because, you know, there's this notion in undergirding a great deal of political theory and political science and uh, the notion of, of a just government and all that, that, um, you know, there's a, the consent of the governed, right, that we consented to this. And, uh, you know, indigenous peoples, we, we didn't consent to any of this shit. Uh, you know, we, we didn't say that this was okay. This is not what we planned for when we signed those treaties or when we didn't sign them. Um, and so, you know, there's a fundamental sort of unconsensuality to uh, modern life, to a state like the United States, to a state like Canada uh, that has never been addressed or, or reconciled. And, you know, I... I'm a wonk. I, I love to nerd out with the wonkiest of them. I get to publish a lot of and work on a lot of uh, really cool policy papers and stuff regarding, you know, Green New Deal for public housing, all that sort of stuff. But fundamentally sort of underlying, um, in my view, uh, sort of what we need to do to sort of restore a notion of um, consent, of what right relationship, of uh, the relationship of a sovereign uh, government to the United States to sovereign tribal nations is fundamentally to sort of recognize the, the power and agency of what has always been there, what, what came before. And in this instance, uh, you know, of indigenous uh, nations. And I think that that sort of, that notion can take you in a lot of different directions. Guido uh, generously quoted me in an article I wrote uh, a number of months ago. Uh, there's also ways in which it can, it can take you towards uh, the stewardship of resources, uh, there are ways that it can take you towards uh, the fundamental truth, which is that uh, treaties are, are founding documents in the same way that the Constitution is. Uh, in fact, the Constitution describes them as, quote, the supreme law of the land. Um, and, you know, when we're thinking through sort of how uh, we engage in a just um, transition, we often talk about all these green and new things that we need, uh, you know, better batteries, uh, whole lot of infrastructure, um, you know, sort of the mechanisms and institutions to finance those things, uh, planning capacity to make sure that we do it in ways that are just and equitable. Um, but inherently, I think before all those things, I think we need to, to recognize uh, the, the strength and power of the things that are already there. I think a lot of the things that you're going to build a Green New Deal with, we already have. Um, and so that was sort of the, the, the fundamental uh, point I was trying to get across in, in my uh, short chapter. I guess if you buy the book, which you should, uh, you don't have to read my chapter now because I just gave you a quick synopsis of it. Um, but, you know, I think that that's sort of a, a sort of idea that I'm, I'm still very interested in 
and um, one that I, uh, I'll be honest, I'm still, I think, exploring what, what fully that would mean if you take it into different realms of policy and culture and uh, society and all that sort of stuff. What would it mean to recognize the power and agency of, of the things that are already there? Thank you, Julian. Uh, Julian is being modest, but he is a good writer uh, and you should read his chapter. Um, so we've been talking a lot about strategy, building a multiracial movement um, to win. And Alex Rojas has spent the past year running insurgent candidates against the democratic establishment, an establishment that has been all too willing to uh, accept and appease the rights uh, strategy of divide and conquer racism. So Alex, my question for you is, uh, is it working? When you're out there with Jamal Bowman in the Bronx or with Cori Bush or, or Marie Newman, are you seeing candidates embracing the Green New Deal, not just because they think it's the right thing to do, but to mobilize voters? And are you seeing that movement on the ground translate into victories at, at, at the ballot box, or maybe these candidates would just win with or without the Green New Deal. Um, and you know, perhaps we haven't done enough to design a policy that, that can really sustain the movement that, that we need. What do you think, Alex? Well, I, the short answer is that it's been transformative, but before I get into that, I just wanna say thank you guys so much for having me here and just hearing the other panelists talk, it's just lifted my spirits when I know so many folks are going through so, so much. Um, so I agree. And I'm still working my way through the book myself. Um, besides my chapter, I just got to focus in on that. So it's been great to catch up on all of y'all's <laughs> um, that, that are in there. Um, but it's been essential. I, I think it's been transformative for the campaigns that we've been a part of. Um, and you've heard for a lot of different reasons why the Green New Deal uh, is, is transformative in and of itself. Not only is it a pragmatic political strategy uh, that we have to address racism, right? It's not only a good framework for policy and a posi policy proposal in and of itself. It happens also to appeal to voters and it's a powerful enough concept to motivate thousands of volunteers across the country that have allowed us to not just, you know, protest and uh, be a you know, mobilize in the streets, but it's also allowing us to translate that power into the halls of Congress, which is absolutely essential in the fight for not just a Green New Deal, but everything um, that we want in a progressive agenda. It's going to come if we get to a point where we can get Democratic majorities and we actually get Democrats that are going to get in there and fight like hell uh, to, to center working people relentlessly. Um, and, and so the way that we've been, you know, seeing that translate on the ground and, you know, has been uh, through the policy itself, right, talking about it in a way that's not just, you know, a wonky, you know, environmental issue, but actually relating to and meeting voters where they're at right now. Um, we're in the middle of, of, of a global pandemic. Uh, we're seeing protests in the street in response to like what Varshini was saying before and the murders of, of George Floyd and so many others. And where voters are feeling that uh, not just on the news, but in many cases like Corey Bush's district on the streets. And even before the pandemic in a place like St. Louis, uh, the, this has been a city in decline for the past 30 years. Um, the moment you step into St. Louis County, there's a life expectancy gap of 20 years between white and black residents. Uh, this is, you know, the state of where voters are in many parts of the country. It's not just in New York, it's in the heartland. Um, and so a Green New Deal, not just talking about it from a climate change perspective, but really connecting it with economic justice and racial justice um, makes it more salient for, for voters. And I think uh, Julian at Data for Progress knows this too, right? We're seeing it across the country, how, how popular it is. The other thing that, that I mentioned um, is that it's not only powerful enough to appeal to, to voters, it's powerful enough to actually get people excited to engage in this movement. Um, you know, Varshney was, was there uh, at the moment that we, want, we launched Jamal Bowman along Sunrise, and they were with us until the very, very end when, we, uh, when they helped usher in over 850,000 phone calls. Uh, to get Jamal elected. Um, they were huge and pivotal in Cori Bush's race. 
And all of those, uh, you know, teenagers, <laughs> in a lot of cases from across the country that were motivated, that were inspired to get to work to elect these Green New Teal champions only were there because two years before in 2018, uh, a bunch of young folks, us at Justice Democrats and dozens of others across, you know, New York City helped elect send Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to Congress in 2018. We were able to meet folks at Sunrise to partner and launch a Green New Deal. And so all of the volunteer energy and momentum that has come out of this connection between climate, economic justice, racial justice, and then merging that into our electoral strategy and movement building strategy has been essential, I think, in pushing over candidates like Jamal Bowman and Cori Bush um, to, to get into Congress. And so this, that's what we try to do in the, in the chapter of this book is talk about why not only is the Green New Deal so essential to, you know, this existential threat that, that we're all facing that are on our planet, but it's also essential for our movement as we adopt strategies to not just go up against bad, Dem, uh, bad Republicans, but also engage in these primary fights uh, and the struggle to transform the Democratic Party and make sure that we're translating a lot of the uh, momentum that we're seeing in the streets into political power. Um, so yeah, it's definitely working. Yes. Thank you, Alex. Oh, that's awesome. That got me pumped. We have won a lot this year, even if things are a little bit depressing. Um, I mean, just where you left off, I think I'm really, you know, Sunrise has been thinking a lot about what the next six months pose for us. And Looking forward, it feels like there's a real, you know, we're at a real crossroads. Um, we could have an in enormous opportunity on the horizon if we are looking at a possible, you know, Biden administration. Um, he may not have perhaps been the top candidate for many climate activists this primary cycle, but given that throughout history, we have seen some of the most um, like far reaching forays into achieving justice in this country happen under moderate presidents. I think there could be a lot that happens because it's abundantly clear that having, you know, Joe Biden as president gives us um, far greater terrain to fight for a Green New Deal than Donald Trump. And, um, you know, there have been a lot of plans that have emerged over the last few months and, and we're anticipating that the first hundred days of a Biden administration could be um, a, a, a massive investment in green jobs and infrastructure to help combat the um, economic downturn that has happened as a result of the pandemic that maybe could be the first down payment on a Green New Deal that we see and could be the kickstart, uh, the launching pad for this 10 year mobilization that Rihanna talked about. Um, and so I guess I, I kind of want to do a bit of a lightning round with all of you and get a sense, um, maybe we'll go to, to um, Rihanna and Julian first, but as we're looking out to 2021 and, and a potential Biden administration, what are you the most hopeful for in terms of winning a Green New Deal on the legislative front? Um, and maybe what are you most afraid of in terms of the Green New Deal going into the next legislative session? So I don't know who wants to start. You can fight, fight about it, but <laughs> someone can pick that up. Well, judging from Julian's mouth, I'm going to go first. Um, so, I mean, I say, I would say that what makes me most excited and hopeful about the Green New Deal is that we need it economically in a way that I think is far clearer than it has been. We are in... Um, a uh, recession with unemployment numbers, the depths of which we have not seen really since the Great Depression. And it is shaping up to be a long recovery and one that is something that people call a K-shaped recovery, which is essentially the people on the top half of the country do well, fine or better, as we've seen like some billionaires make more money from the pandemic and the bottom 50% of folks really suffer tremendously. Uh, like we're seeing the eviction, um, the sort of mass number uh, amount of eviction happening right now. And, and so that puts us in a place where the American economy is far more vulnerable and doesn't have as many growth opportunities as I think we are used to or would like. And um, the green, um, clean energy, green technology, so, 
uh, agriculture, there's so many spaces where uh, investing in climate action is, is actually going to be really fundamental to the future of the American economy. So that, uh, that makes me hopeful because when people want to do this out of the goodness of their hearts, it doesn't get done when it has to do with what's happening in your wallet. <laughs> what's happening in the wallet of the country, uh, it gets more, more important. Uh, and the thing that I fear the most is actually austerity in the sense that uh, we will respond to this, particularly if there is a Democrat elected, that there will be far more uh, concern about the deficit, how much we're spending, uh, et cetera. And we will put in place austerity that will not only just hurt people, period, but will uh, really hamper the chances of having essentially a big investment initiative like the Green New Deal. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add on to that. Um, so like Rihanna, I'm, I'm pretty concerned about the spendthrift Democrats. Uh, you know, I guess it is a Haymarket Books event. So we might as well say, you know, there's this guy, a uh, German philosopher, uh, once said something along the lines of, First as tragedy, second as, and then I guess you can fill in the blank. And the next few months are going to kind of fill in the blank. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, there's a lot of parallels between the moment that we find ourselves in and uh, the first term of the Obama administration. Uh, you know, the, the first term of the Obama administration, of course, began with an enormous recession. Uh, and what happened is that they, they passed a sim stimulus, uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. It was too small. Uh, which is, I think, points to uh, the, the, the correctness of Rihanna's concern about, uh, you know, austerity. Uh, and then there was, of course, the second part about that. Before we had um, Ocasio-Cortez marquee, we had this thing called Waxman marquee, which was a cap and trade bill. Uh, and uh, the cap and trade bill, of course, got through the House of Representatives, but never made it to the Senate floor for a vote. And from a 30,000 foot perspective, I'm also concerned about the scenario where uh, we pass some sort of clean energy stimulus, but the second part about that, uh, where we implement the, the regulations to uh, make sure that there is a cutting edge of decarbonization, uh, you know, doesn't happen. So I really hope that, uh, that this time we, we get, get these things right. Uh, and there's a number, uh, you know, a cascading number of other things that we got to make sure that, that get done correctly, but from the highest level, um, you know, uh, in this instance, I guess, I hope uh, our favored German philosopher is incorrect. Awesome. Thanks, Julian. Um, okay, I guess sort of the same question, a little bit different to, to Ian and Alex. Um, if we're kind of considering the next year of American politics, you're seeing, you know, Biden versus Trump um uh play out on the national scene and the ongoing sort of struggles and and battle sort of for the soul of the democratic party um i'm kind of curious like what are what are you most hopeful for and and most afraid of other than other than the most obvious thing that we can all say which is a second trump term so uh, alex do you want to go no you go ahead <laughs> okay so you know it, it, in some ways i'd say you know, the things I'm most afraid of, um, wow. What we are witnessing right now is massive cascading systems failures in Western liberal democracy. And we're witnessing that in terms of an economic implosion for most people while the billionaires get richer and more powerful. We're witnessing the collapse of effective healthcare, 190,000 deaths the overwhelming majority of which could have been prevented. We're witnessing the collapse of our democratic institutions. We have now a major political party which no longer believes in or will act to protect democratic institutions, but is instead uh, affirmatively subverting democratic norms like vote, voting integrity. We have the harbingers of climate collapse. They are upon us. They're right here now. We have an end to a sense that we are a society uh, that is institutionally committed to equality because instead the government has been harnessed to a project of systematic violence against communities of color. As a political project, when we think about the murder of George Floyd, that's not white racism in general that did that, not even a culture of racism in the police. 
That's 50 years of politicians campaigning by telling scare stories about black and brown communities. And then when they're elected, building prisons, funding the police, militarizing the police, not just Republicans, but Democrats who think, wow, in order to compete with the Republicans, they will tell the same scare stories. We are seeing the major institutions of, of our society revealed as failures, which are jeopardizing our life chances. And all of this, I think, is this, uh, this sort of tornado of, of, of different crises, cascading, accumulating crises that are really you know, focused right now, I think, in terms of November 3rd, this, this next election. Which direction are we going to go? What are we going to do? Are things going to get much worse? Are they going to accelerate beyond a point of repair? Or will we turn a corner and make repair at least a distant possibility? That's my fear. And then I'm so now I'm just going to like, uh, Rihanna, what was that drink? What are you drinking? I'm going to have some too. No. <laughs> so so here's the here's the hope though, and it and it's a, and it's a real hope. It's a genuine hope. Um, the research I've been doing, plus the work that I think Sunrise and Justice Democrats are doing are showing that the system's failures are now obvious. And one of the big challenges for social change is always when people normalize failure, when they normalize inequality, when they normalize suffering, that's not what's happening right now. People right now are waking up and saying, this isn't working. We've got to make a change. And that makes change possible. A lot of the research I've done shows that when we say to people, hey, we really want to take care of each other, but the real threat in our lives comes from powerful elites who stoke division while they profit and, and they rig the economy for themselves and they, and they trash the environment because it's good for their bottom line. We can turn this around when we build bridges across division, come together and take care of each other. That, it turns out, hopefully, in a way that engenders hope, I should say, is the most powerful political message out there right now, today. And so here's this other thing that really gives me hope. I really want to um, endorse the, the dual strategy of Sunrise and the Justice Democrats. And by dual strategy, I mean a combination of smart electoral interventions and also mass mobilization. We will need to, we will need to participate in the electoral system and we will need to do, we will need to encourage mass cross-racial class conscious mobilization in order to actually shift who these candidates are, who's getting elected and what government does. That really is the source of my hope, that that everybody's gonna buy the book and read it. Um, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how likely that is. I think far more likely the model of Sunrise and the model of the Justice Democrats is a renewed engagement with democracy. Let me tie it back to what, what Julian said about consent. Consent doesn't exist we can see clearly that consent doesn't exist for Native Americans for whom it was formally denied. Consent no longer exists for any of us. Our ability to participate meaningfully in this democracy has been substantially eroded through a, through a tactic of fomenting social, di social division. We can insist again in our ability to participate in the necessity of garnering consent. That's what I think Sunrise and Justice Democrats mass movements uh, and the indigenous movements are insisting upon. Make the ideals of a democracy by and for all of us, our North Star as we create institutions that make that ever more real for all of us. Awesome. Thank you, Ian. That was amazing. That was, for those watching, that is Sunrise's Theory of Change. Ian Haney Lopez is now <laughs> the spokesperson for Sunrise Movement. Welcome to the team, Ian. I'm going to take a vacation. Um, <laughs> but no, really appreciate that. That was that was a really sharp, I think, download of everything that also needs to happen on the political front. And particularly, I think, um, there are other great chapters also from Reverend Willie Barber and, and others who have been, you know, also talking about this like fusion politics, this cross race, multi class coalition that needs to come together if we are going to going to actually win many of the ambitious policies that we're talking about in, in, in a Green New Deal. Um, OK, and last but not least, send it to you, Alex. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I'll I'll. Um... 
I'll just say, Ian, that made me hopeful. So thanks for that. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll start with what I'm most afraid of. Um, I, I think Ian just laid out, there is a number of over, extremely overwhelming, at least speaking for myself, and I'm sure many of many people across the country, existential threats that are facing us. And uh, it, it doesn't only feel like that, we, we can see it, right? That the folks that are in power uh, not only want to not accept responsibility for the management of our nation's decline, right? Which we saw in the pandemic, just how totally shot our national supply chain is and our ability to respond in a moment of crisis. And it can feel at times really powerless because in a lot of ways we, we are, right? Um, we're not yet in positions of power. Uh, we're not at the top of the democratic ticket though trying really hard, um, at least at the presidential level uh, to, to get there. But I'm, and, and, and by, you know, you know, to, to even an even more simple way say is that um, I'm concerned about just like many people, the safety and well-being of all of the people that I love. Um, but I am so hopeful because I am not alone and I'm relatively new, at least coming out of the woodwork, like a lot of folks, I think, young people in particular in 2016, um, that did not think that there was this whole movement of people that cared deeply about uh, wanting to, you know, figure out, work backwards from the problem and figure out not just how, how to solve it, but do it in a way that is intersectional and that meets people where they're at. Uh, and that we're not only doing that um, in our isolated little bubbles, it's really happening as a movement that's translating into power, right? Cori Bush and Jamal Bowman aren't as much as they will continue to say flukes or uh, two people in a room of 400, they are representing alongside the six plus other members of the squad, millions of people across this country who are ready for a Green New Deal and who are ready to transform this country uh, more than ever because they are seeing it uh, in a way. Um, and I can't tell you how, how critical um, that that is and that how crazy it is that we're all uh, living in this time to be able to see it. Um, I think it's, you know, you don't always recognize a moment of history when you're in one and that's this moment. Um, and, and this book, um, you know, is, is, is really special in communicating, I think a lot of the stories um, that, that inspire, I think a lot of that hope that I know that, you know, folks that weren't as, as tapped into politics until a few years ago are. So I'm still working my way through it and I hope lots of others do too. It's hopeful for me. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate that response big time. Um, so y'all have been sending in your questions and I wish we had the time to dig into all of them because they are juicy. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to talk, I'm going to maybe pose one question in particular that I'm really interested in. Um, and maybe I'll kick this to Guido first. Um, the question is, some union folks resist because they don't want job training. They want jobs as good as the ones they have now. How do we get all unions on board with the Green New Deal by ensuring that workers don't lose out? Um, so Guido, why don't you kick it off and then we can um, uh, we can pass to others if, if, if others are interested in responding. Yeah, um, I'll say two things quickly on this. So one point, uh, from Mary Kay Henry's chapter that I think is just essential is there's no need to offer workers worse jobs who are transitioning out of high carbon sectors. Uh, we just pumped trillions of dollars into the economy to keep, you know, vast sectors of the corporate economy um, afloat. We can create good paying union jobs, um, doing conservation, building solar panels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think we need to make that commitment and we need to be joining arm in arm with unions like SEIU who have endorsed uh, the Green New Deal to fight to win those jobs. Um, the second point is more political and I think is a great point that Bob Master, who's a, a labor leader from CWA makes in his chapter is that I think that the case needs to be made to labor that the GND is not just another like you know, policy fight that they're going to get through in the many policy fights that they've been doing um, over the past 
you know, four decades of trying to fight back against anti-union attacks. Um, the Green New Deal is a response to the climate crisis, which is going to define the economy for the next century. And I think there's a risk that labor um, stays in a defensive crouch and doesn't get ahead of the ball. And Bob makes this comparison to the AFL in the New Deal is wholly focused on organizing craft laborers or skilled laborers and basically doesn't care about wide swaths of unskilled immigrant labor. And the AFL loses power because the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, just starts to organize unskilled workers and shifts the politics of, of, of the New Deal. Now, ultimately, they merge and that becomes the AFL-CIO. But Bob makes this warning to unions and says, you don't want to be like the AFL in 1934-35, thinking that you're going to do the same politics and, and keep winning because um, you might get leapfrogged by organizers and leaders and workers who are claiming their role in the new economy. Thanks, Guido. Does anybody else have thoughts on that or things they want to add to it? Yeah, it's great context, especially from one of the book contributors. Yeah, Ian? CWA have really been at the forefront of moving towards a sort of a race class analysis, a story that says, hey, race is being weaponized against us. That doesn't mean we ignore racism in favor of class issues. That means that we recognize that in order to make progress on economic fairness, we need to address racial division. We need to address racism. They've been at the forefront of it. And I think for the labor movement in general, that's what the GND offers not just a route to a new sector of the economy, but a way for labor itself to answer the, the main force that has undercut labor, that has led to the drastic diminishment of organized labor over the last 50 years. It's precisely dog whistle politics with support from many union members. We think about the Reagan Democrats. Those are union members who are voting for politicians whose main allegiance is to the rich and whose main economic agenda vis-a-vis -vis unions is to demolish them. So the unions themselves need a story to help their members pivot away from organizing their political identities around racial resentment and towards reorganizing their identities around cross-racial solidarity and workplace solidarity. And I think the GND provides a, a, a sort of a clear frame for the unions to articulate that message to their members saying, get on board with this, with this agenda that is about the environment, it's about fighting racism, things you don't typically think you need to fight for because fighting against racism, fighting for a Green New Deal are, is really the best thing that you can do for your own family. I'm gonna rattle off three really quick points as fast as possible because it's after nine. I really wanna eat my shrimp fried rice because I'm hungry as hell. Um, okay, so three really quick points. Um, okay, firstly, uh, in Rewiring America, Saul Griffith uh, makes, the, makes the sort of research-based claim that we could create 25 million jobs in the next five years uh, by electrifying the United States. Um, I think that a key thing for progressives to be focused on here isn't just the creation of those jobs, but the emergent sort of um, trade-off that, that, that moderates are going to put in front of us around uh, the fact that folks want to save cost on their energy bills and the fact that we want to create jobs. And of course, that we also want those jobs to be union jobs. Uh, and they're going to say that you can't have all those th these things at once. And we're going to say, yeah, we, we need to have all those things at once. Um, so that's point number one. Point number two, uh, I think that very often there is uh, around the conversations about labor and a just transition, uh, an emphasis on uh, rightly, you know, like the jobs and, and the material reality. But uh, recently, I well, a few months ago now, actually, but what is time anymore anyways, uh, I had a conversation with um, an advisor to a particular West Virginia, um, a former advisor to a particular West Virginia uh, politician who will remain unnamed, who made the point that it's not that coal and coal jobs are actually an enormous part of the economy of that state anymore, um, you know, which empirically they are, they're actually not, and we need to take care of those workers. But the other part about, about labor, and this is a point that another 
Um, we're talking about a lot of German uh, social scientists today, but this is a Max Weber point, right? That work isn't just about, um, you know, its economic benefits to you. It's also about its significance and meaning to you. you know, that's the whole idea behind the whole quote unquote Protestant work ethic idea is that people attach cultural significance to their jobs. And in West Virginia, there's a major college football game and it's called the Coal Bowl. So I think when we talk about things like uh, a just transition, I think we also need to be thinking about um, you know, the cultural signifiers and what work means and how people value you know, their dignity and labor and, and what that means to you as a person. You know, there's an entire culture that exists around these things. And then a the last point I think, um, and I think this is a particularly important as we think about more broadly and uh, in a more sort of equitable way, what a just transition is. There's all these green jobs out there. And we, we wrote a short report about uh, the way that green jobs are very narrowly defined. Uh, Data for Progress did that with the Century Foundation. Um, and there's all these green jobs out there that are uh, not usually thought of that way. You know, it's not folks who are necessarily installing solar panels or whatever, but it's the folks who are taking care of our, our grandparents or our parents. It's the folks who are teaching our kids. Uh, you know, it's the folks who are providing us healthcare. Those are green jobs too. And I think it's really, really important uh, that we, especially as we sort of shift towards a more caring economy, which is just gonna happen demographically, that we expand the definition and we stop, uh, stop having this like very gendered, very sort of blue collar, like white dude driven notion of what a green job and what labor is and looks like. I think that's really essential. Um, and there's lots of folks who are much more involved and brighter than me on that, on that point. Awesome. Wow. Okay. That was phenomenal. Thank you all so much for those insights. Um, so unfortunately, I feel like I could talk to you guys for hours and sometimes we do, um, but, but I, we're going to have to close out this conversation for tonight. Um, before we move on, um, Alex, I just wanted to give you a chance if you wanted to say anything in closing um, or, or have a last word here before um, I make some announcements and then close all of us out. Thank you so much. Well, first, thank you guys so much for, for having me. And I'll just leave. I, I know that we're all plugging this this book, but it's also, uh, you know, trying to inspire people to really think about the movement that we're all a part of and what it's going to take to really build the world that we want to see. And so um, one thing that feels so obvious all the time, at least speaking for my chapter, is challenging and defeating Donald Trump. Uh, but one thing we also critically have to do is make sure that our foundation in the Democratic Party, uh, you know, speaks vehemently for this vision that we all want for our values and that primaries are a key part of our strategy uh, to, I think, be able to, to build that. So thank you, Varshini, for, you know, allowing us to be a part of a part of the book. Absolutely. Thanks for being here, Alex. And thank you, all of you, for being here as well and watching this. Um, so before we close out, I just want to remind you of a couple of things that you can do to spread the message about winning the Green New Deal um, to as many people as possible. The first is, you guessed it, getting a copy of the book. Um, and you can get them anywhere where you get your books. Support your local bookstore, um, like Porter Square Books in my neck of the woods. Um, or you could get it on Simon & Schuster's page and Amazon and Barnes & Noble, etc. Um, the second most important thing that you can do to support the book is leaving a review wherever you purchased it. Um, the reviews really help us build more momentum. And frankly, we're also just really curious to hear um, what you all have to say and how you perceived it. Um, and the third thing is we need you to join the movement. Everything that is in this book None of it is going to happen. This beautiful vision that we have of a more just and equitable future cannot happen unless we are building power by the millions in the streets, but electing insurgent candidates um, and making this policy vision that we so believe in into reality. And it can happen, but it has to involve every single one of us um, to make it work. So um, go to sunrisemovement.org, uh, go to Justice Democrats, dot com um, and check out data for progress. Are you guys data for progress dot org or dot com dot org? But you should org. just follow us on Twitter da at data progress at data progress. <laughs> um, and Ian, if you have <laughs> if you'd like us to plug a website, more than happy to do it. Oh, we can't hear you. Oh, there you are. Say it yeah. again. Raceclassacademy.com. It's got yes. some explainer videos. Raceclassacademy.com. 
Yes, awesome. Sorry, should have totally blanked on that. Um, and so join the movement, join in whatever capacity you can. We have so much important work ahead of us. Um, and so really, really am grateful to everyone for being here. Um, and last but not least, I just wanna take a moment um, to announce the winners of a raffle that we did this last weekend. We raffled off a number of books for free and the winner should be on the slide. I can't actually see it, so I'm hoping that it's up there. Otherwise, um, you will know that it's you because you will get an email um, that will have instructions for how to get your book, your t-shirt, your sticker, and everything else. Um, and for everyone else, I'm sorry you didn't win, but you can still get a copy of the book um, wherever you purchase your books. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Guido, my fearless co-editor. Um, thank you to the contributors for your con contribution to the book, but the contributions you make to the world every single day. We would not be here without you. Um, thank you, Haymarket Books. Thank you, Porter Square Books. And have a wonderful evening. Um, and yeah, stay safe out there.